Welcome to Eudaimonia, the podcast that is all about flourishing. Plug in, relax, and get ready for the goodness as we explore the traits and practices that can help you thrive in life. With your host, Kim Forrester. Is it possible for us to express ourselves in ways that are fully aligned with who we truly know ourselves to be? Rebecca Smith is an entrepreneurial leader and renowned marketing and branding expert. Since 2014, she's been entrusted to lead New Zealand Story, a joint private-public initiative within the New Zealand government designed to enhance the perception of Aotearoa New Zealand around the world. I'm delighted to be connecting with Rebecca today to talk about the value of authenticity and to discuss why our lives are enhanced when we choose to express ourselves in consciously authentic ways. Rebecca, welcome to the Eudaimonia podcast. It's an absolute delight to have you here with me today. How are you there in Auckland? It's, uh, it's very, very foggy and we're finding our way this morning. But thank you very much for having me today. It's very <laughs> honoured. That's a nice way to put it, finding our way. Now, I wanted to chat to you in particular because earlier this year I actually wrote an article reflecting on what life could be like if we look to the corporate world as an example of how to be more conscious, more careful, shall we say, about our personal brand. So to start us off, can you perhaps summarize the process or the effort that goes into developing an effective commercial marketing and messaging strategy? Yeah, that's actually a really difficult question because it, it depends on the situation you're in. But I guess regardless of that situation, I firmly believe that you have to bring yourself to whatever brand or endeavour you're leading. So you bring your personal self to that because great brands and and businesses, they reflect human endeavour and they reflect our personality and and our personalities are indelibly imprinted on those brands and those endeavours. So I guess my sense is that if you see, for example, a brand that you don't necessarily trust or you don't feel is authentic, then there's probably someone behind that brand who isn't delivering an authentic self into the work that they're doing or worse, there's no one behind that company or that brand. So there's actually no guardianship or parent to guard that brand. Um, so I think you've, you've got to bring yourself to it and you've, you've got to find, I think, the commercial endeavours and the businesses that reflect your own set of values so that you can be authentic in the work that you do and the way that you bring that to life through a, through a commercial endeavour or through a brand. But in terms of the actual time and the effort, the sitting down and the chatting about different elements, can you explain a little bit about that? Because most listeners, I guess, would have no concept of the effort that goes into, say, branding New Zealand Story or mm-hmm. branding Coca-Cola. There are weeks, months, sometimes even years, aren't there, that go in behind the scenes? There are years that go in behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. And there's an awful lot of engagement. So the, so the first part of really in, in determining what you stand for or what your brand is there to achieve is to understand how people currently perceive you or your brand and whether that be a Coca-Cola or your country, you've got to go out there and really talk to people and find out what they currently think, what their, what their perceptions are, what their hidden perceptions are, what their underlying barriers or issues might be. And it takes time. You really have to dig deep. Um, because people are genuinely quite nice and, and like to be quite nice and, and sort of don't really want to offend others when they're asked, you know, what do you think of such and such? Mm. So you have to really dig deep. And, and in the work that we do for our country, we go into offshore markets and spend time with consumers and with buyers and with influencers in focus groups with an anthropologist who's very skilled at peeling away those layers and you know there can be cultural layers it could be all sorts of nuances that you have to pull apart to understand well how exactly are we seen and what do you feel about us what do you think is authentic what do you want to hear from us and what do you believe where can we go to in terms of how we portray ourselves that is believable and what stretch so you do need to spend an awful lot of time doing that because if you're trying to shift perceptions, the most important part is to understand what those perceptions currently are. Mm. You really, otherwise, you're just making it up, and um, and what you end up with will be a surprise to your consumer or to the person you're you're trying to portray that to. See, this is what I find astounding. Corporations can spend years doing the research, discovering how they're perceived in the world, and then trying to brand themselves and make sure that their messaging is aligned with what they stand for and who they are. 
Yet as individuals, so many of us are quite thoughtless in the way that we tread through the world. You know, you only have to look on the internet to know that people are just blurting out whatever's top of mind a lot of the time without any thought to how they are actually portraying themselves in that moment. So from your vast experience in the corporate world, can you see ways that our lives and perhaps our society could benefit as we as individuals were a little more careful with our personal messaging? Yeah, look, this is, um, I've got two young daughters, two young teenage daughters, and this is a conversation I have with them quite often is about their brand, their personal brand, and what they stand for and how they want to be perceived and the impact that some of their decisions and their behaviours have on that, Mm -hmm. and whether they're comfortable with the outcomes around that. I, I don't know that we take the time to really help our young folk in particular understand that. I don't know that they're necessarily aware of the impact until it's too late. You know, through our work here, we we use social media, we use it as a very efficient and effective platform to reach a whole range of people across the world. But I do feel that in years to come, we're potentially going to look back at social media channels and wonder why on earth we let them be sort of so rampantly used for such young people in particular without some training around it. I mean, we're really, you know, unleashing these platforms to kids that are 13, 14 who don't have that self-awareness and it follows through and you start to see that in the attitudes and the behaviours of, of people um, in their 20s, 30s and 40s who, who sort of also don't have a sense of consequence around that. And I think, it's, I think we're in a really uncomfortable place right now on that, that we haven't in the past had to really think so carefully about that because we haven't had the platforms to amplify those conversations and we do now and we're not prepared. So, yeah, I think through through schools and through universities and through, you know, early career development, there needs to be a lot more emphasis on that aspect of it, of self-management and self-control. Mm, oh, two very important words. And through parenting as well, as you were saying. Mm. So you've got two daughters and you were saying there that, you know, certainly in the corporate arena, the first thing you do before you send out a message, before you even formulate a message, is to make sure that you're going to be perceived in an authentic way and also in a way that that truly reflects who you are on the inside. You are obviously asking your daughters to stop and reflect a little bit more about those very factors before they go on social media. Do you think that it's possible for us as individuals to undertake the kind of deep self-reflection that you do in the corporate world and do you think it's actually healthy for us to do so do you think that maybe we can get a little bit obsessive about how people perceive us to be (laughs) yes and no I do think it takes us a long time to figure out what we stand for Um, and that's the maturing process and often many of us don't have necessarily the right opportunity or the right environment to even express that if we were to know that or to make the right choices or to make choices that are aligned to those particular principles so I think if we were to, to really reflect deeply in those situations, one might become quite unhappy and because you feel that you're not being authentic or you can't execute against your, your belief system. Mm. Um, so I think it is very complicated and, and whilst it's important to endeavour to do that, when you've got the opportunity, I think we have to realise that many people aren't able to make those changes and has to live with constraints or compromises and yeah I think it can be really unhealthy to dwell on that too much if you're not in a position to make changes around it. If you are then fabulous but I think Mm. if you're constrained it can be a very unhappy place. Well that's a really interesting point because what happens if yes you want to express your authentic self but through social constraints or whatnot you're unable to do so do you think that that actually undermines our health and well-being in some way? Mm. Oh, I do. I do. And, you know, as I say, if you've got the opportunity to make changes in that environment, to say, well, actually, I'm doing something that doesn't sit well with me or I'm in a situation that doesn't work with my principles or my values, mm. then ideally you'd try and seek help to, to find a different place. And I'd say that even in the corporate world. If you're in an organisation or you're working around people who you feel uncomfortable with, if it doesn't sit well with you personally, then that's the time to go and seek a change, to look for something else. 
And so when you are empowered to make those changes and you have got the options to do that, then I definitely you know, encourage anyone to do that so that you can be in a place where you are being authentic and that you have a sense of integrity about the work that you're doing and the people that you're with and the decisions that you're making. I'm just conscious, though, that that might be quite difficult for a whole range of people. So I think we've got to be careful about sort of saying, well, just get out there and change the situation. Mm -hmm. and sure. Take control and be empowered. Um, because there are people in certain countries and certain social situations who go, well, you know, walk a mile in my shoes and try and do that. Yeah. So let's put that on its head then, because one thing I think we can take responsibility for is the way that we allow and encourage authenticity in others then. Mm. Do you feel that we can take responsibility to uh, draw out of other people their authentic self, their authentic opinions, their authentic beliefs and perceptions? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And that's, that's leading, by example, that's being true to your own self. And when you are true, then you find that others around you will be drawn to that. And if they're not, then probably find a different group to, <laughs> to mix with. But certainly, you know, reflecting that in my own, in, in my own example and leading, you know, corporates and brands and, and business groups, you know, I feel that there's a huge sense of responsibility that I have to demonstrate my own authenticity and, and integrity and expect others to do that too. And if I see things that I don't feel comfortable with, to, to speak up and to find a better solution to that. Yeah, so I definitely think we, we all need to take that level of responsibility if we're able to. I can see that courage is required in order to be authentic in a couple of ways. Firstly, in order to speak up against the crowd sometimes if you're feeling uneasy about something. But the second facet that I feel could be quite uncomfortable and could take personal courage is actually reflecting on one's own shadow side because authenticity obviously requires some us to know ourselves inside out. So what do we do when we find that inevitable dark side? If we're to be truly authentic, Rebecca, do you think it's wisest for us to sort of express those dark sides of ourselves or suppress them? Well, I think suppressing them is, is probably un the more unhealthy option. Finding ways to, to resolve for them is the better solution. I think it is important to be honest and vulnerable in terms of understanding what, what, we're, what we're capable of or, or what we feel needs to be improved and then agitate for better. And, and that's something that I certainly advocate for and with all my teams and people around me is to always agitate for better not in a negative way, but to, to look for the improvement, to find a better way to do things, to be better people, to be as authentic through everything that we do that we can. So I, I do feel with that sort of self-reflection also needs to come a sense of restlessness about improvement. It might take time, but I think that's exciting. That's when you learn and you reflect and you can see yourself developing and you can see the other people around you becoming kind of improved versions of themselves. Mm. There again, a, a way that we can actually help and encourage others is to perhaps allow them to have those dark, icky sides and encourage them through that very discomforting process of agitating for better. I love the way you say that. <laughs> now, you speak a lot about trust in your articles and your interviews, and obviously in marketing, trust is of ultimate importance. Do you think there's a link between being authentic and being trusted? Trust is an outcome of authenticity. Right. Um, I mean, you can have transactional or rational or functional trust. You know, I trust that the ATM will, will spit out my money or mm. I trust that, the, you know, that this power switch will work. That's sort of transactional. But to get emotional trust, you really have to feel that what you're being exposed to and the experiences that you're having and everything that follows through from that is authentic, that it's lined up. I mean, as individuals, if you go out and make friends and you're not your true self, if you're not being authentic, those friends will be shallow friends or they, they won't last necessarily because they'll soon discover that you're not who you say you are or who you're pretending to be. And I think that's exactly the same with brands. You know, you might get a, an immediate rush of interest, but longer term, people don't trust you if they don't feel that, that you're being authentic. They want to see consistency and they want to see your personality and your values come through. And that does take a great deal of courage inside an organisation and it takes brand leadership and it takes, you know, you really have to understand that quite deeply and build that sense of authenticity and values and, and principles within an organisation because, you know, it's everyone expressing those consistently that's going to build that trust over time. 
you've spent an awful lot of time dealing with, speaking with, researching consumers, people all over the world. Do you feel that we perhaps underestimate a human's ability to see through the BS? <laughs> do, do you think that people are actually... The, People are actually able to see and feel and sense if you're being inauthentic in ways that oh, totally. we haven't, we don't fully understand yet. Totally. I, I think, I think there are, and, you know, I'm a marketer and I've been in, in branding and marketing for a very long time. And I think there are moments when we will try and kid ourselves that, that what we've produced is wonderful and that everybody loves it. And, and the reality is often far from the truth. So, you know, we do need to get out and really talk to people and understand and dig deep and pull the, pull the layers away. Mm. So what do you really think? What do you really believe in this brand? So as I say, there's transactional trust. There's sort of surface level, I like this because it's convenient or useful for me or it's part of my group. My friends will like me more because I, I use this brand or I'm attached to such and such. But in terms of real trust, it just won't last unless there's an authentic belief system underneath it. If you really go, yes, that particular brand is, is authentic in the way that you live. I mean, you know, C-Dub and, and the whole mm. issues that they've been through, you know, that has that completely and utterly undermined people's sense of trust. Now, does it change your buying behaviour? Not necessarily if you're looking for a transactional relationship. You know, they will, you know, it, it was better priced or it's going to deliver X, Y, Z. But it doesn't deliver real trust. And, and that ultimately impacts your brand long term. You're both your personal brand and a corporate brand long term. So let's talk about pressures to conform here, to, you know, to be fashionable or fit in. In your experience, is it possible for a commercial brand to lose its way, you know, to undermine its standing in the world simply by trying to be something that it's not or by trying too hard to be popular? And what can we as individuals learn from this? Yes, and we see it a lot. And, and it's often what you'll find underneath that is that the brand guardian, the person behind that has changed or is new or there are too many people competing, there are too many competing demands inside an organisation, a lack of clarity, focus, and, and that's what you tend to see turning up when a brand sort of switches direction or tries to be popular on, on XYZ. I mean, I, I look at brands in the same way that I do, you know, your own personality. Mm -hmm. You are who you are. You might dress differently for the weekend versus your business dress, or, you know, you don't wear a bikini to the office, and you don't wear your suit to the beach. But underneath all of that is the same individual with the same set of principles. So as a corporate brand or as a, a consumer brand, you might turn up differently, but your core principles and values have to be consistent. Otherwise, you look schizophrenic and people don't trust you. So what does authenticity feel like to you, Rebecca? You know, when I saw you speak in Singapore, that word authenticity was popping up a lot. And it's obviously something that you value highly and that you attempt to work from as much as possible. What does it feel like to you when you are being authentic? You feel confident. Mm. You feel more confident because you're speaking to your truth and your able to be more flexible. I, I find that when I'm well aligned and, and able to be authentic and do that through the work that I do, then you can put me on stage and anyone can ask me a question. I, I'm not daunted at all because I have this authentic sense of what I'm trying to achieve and, and, what, and the belief system underneath it. So it gives you a great deal more confidence and flexibility and I think it also allows you to be a lot more open-minded and really listen to the questions that are being asked and challenge yourself with those questions. I, I find it, you're less defensive because you're very clear on what you stand for. Mm. It seems to me too that authenticity sounds and feels very powerful, empowering. Do you see a link between authenticity and self-empowerment? Oh, I do. I do. I really do. Because, you know, when, as I say, when you've got that feeling and when you know that you're being authentic and true and that you're bringing your entire self to something and that you're, you're doing the right thing for the right reason, it's extraordinarily empowering. And, and it's, it gives you a true north. You know, there's less sort of self-doubt around that because you simply have to ask yourself, is it the right thing? I love that you bring up the word just true north there because it seems to me that we have to understand that our compass is going to point to a slightly different direction to the person next to us, correct? Mm. So 
in your experience, does authenticity also bring a difference in beliefs and a difference in values and a difference in personalities? It does. It does. And, and it's, it's beautiful because then you learn through that mm. uh, and it helps you to continue to refine your own view because you're open to somebody else's authentic perspective. And, and as long as that person is acting with integrity and, and you see that and you feel that, then it's a tremendous opportunity to be inquisitive and to say, mm. well, wh why do you feel that way? Or let's explore why we've got such different perspectives on this and be considerate of other people's viewpoints. I think it gives you, as I say, being able to live in that authentic way is such a learning opportunity. You, you don't feel as protective or as fearful as new. Wow, what you just said there um, brought up something really powerful for me because being authentic doesn't mean being the same person all through your life then. So, for instance, yeah. a, you will allow a brand to evolve over time. Is that right? Mm. Okay, so should we be doing the same thing as an individual, do you think? Are there ways that we can allow our brand, our self, to evolve whilst we are being authentic. Totally, totally. I think it's, it comes back to that sort of that restless desire to constantly improve. Mm. And one might sort of have a, you know, in your 20s you have a sense of who you are and then in your 40s you look back and wonder who on earth that person was. <laughs> <laughs> you just, you know, environment shapes you, experiences shapes you and as long as you've got an open mind to that and you're constantly willing to learn and adapt and evolve, then you should be somewhat different to who you were 10 or 20 years mm. ago. And the same applies for a brand. There are environmental factors and influences and crises and challenges that force us to, to sort of positively reflect on whether we feel we're doing the right thing or not. And, and that's experience. Experience comes into play there. I think it's pretty clear by now that we ought to value authenticity. But I guess the question remains, though, how do we recognize it, Rebecca? How do we know that the brand or the individual in front of us is expressing themselves in complete alignment with who they are and what they stand for? Often you can't tell until there's a crisis. Mm. Often you don't, and I think a crisis is, an, is, an, is a situation where somebody's true personality comes out, where their authentic self is on display because uh, it's that fight or flight mode that you get into. It's how people react. It's how brands react. So when you see a, an organization go through a particular crisis, that's when you understand whether what they've been saying and what they've been representing is really, really true or not. Mm. Are they going to follow through on that? So if, for example, you say that you're you know, a caring brand and that you really, truly, deeply respect your, you know, the people who, who are within your organisations and you have a crisis and you don't protect those people and you don't behave in that way, then you weren't being authentic. And that's what impacts brand and reputation longer term is how people behave in that situation. Wow, so if we apply that same principle at an individual level, maybe we can allow ourselves to be a little more honest about what we see in the people around us, particularly if they're stressed or in some kind of crisis situation. Should we pay attention to the way they truly behave and the things they say? Yeah, and, and again, you know, often as parents you see that in their children. You see that in their temper tantrums or in their reactions to situations. And, you know, the platitudes that you might hear as a parent of, you know, this is what I believe in or this is what I think or this is what I'm going to do um, often only come to light seriously when you see them in a particular situation that's really uncomfortable and you observe them. And through that, you know, if I think about it at a parenting level, you're able to say, well, I recognise how this individual behaves under stress or in a crisis. Are there some things in there that where they need more help? Mm. Uh, how can I how can I help prepare them for this next time? How can I help them to find their own way through this? What's the opportunity for them to learn through it? And, and the same applies, I think, at any age when you're in those situations. You sit back and reflect and how could I have managed that differently? What was my reaction to that? Is that a reaction that I'm happy with? Is, does that really show who I am? Mm. Um, how would I do that in, uh, differently again? And, and for brands, exactly the same. Mm. How did we react in that situation? Was that a good reaction or was that, was that a shocking example <laughs> <laughs> of brand authenticity shining through? What do we need to, to unpick there to make sure that that doesn't happen again? Wow. 
No, I love that. Um, we all have these moments where we reflect on our own behavior. Well, if, I think if we're being self-reflective and being honest, we can look back and go, oh, my goodness, that didn't sound like me or that's not who I want to sound like. And no. so is this one of these moments where we look to the agitation and the restlessness to grow? And well, here's the question, of course, if it's authentically us, should mm. we not just let it be and forgive it? In our Possibly. Mm. Yeah, possibly, but it's about understanding that and, and being honest about it. So, you know, if I'm in a difficult situation and I behave a certain way, it's about recognising that that's how you're going to behave and that is your true self. Mm. And, and that's what I mean. And in a crisis, that is often your very, very deep true self that mm -hmm. shines through. And that can be very confronting. Yeah. That can be uncomfortable. It, it might not be, you might not react the way that you like to react. So, you know, if you don't like the way that that's coming out, if you don't feel that that is right for you, then that in itself is an opportunity to say, well, I wonder why. I wonder if there was something about that that I could learn from. Or mm. um, if that is my true self and I don't like it showing up, how can I perhaps not be in that situation again? Or how... What else can I do to change that situation? So it comes back to that sort of restlessness, but you do need to be very honest about your own behaviour in those situations. I mean, again, I, I think parenting is a fantastic light yeah. <laughs> and, and opportunity to learn from that. And my 13 year old had, had a very forceful, colourful, and tearful rant at the adults in her house a couple of nights ago. Then she left the room and she returned 20 minutes later and she stood at the door and she said, I'd like to formally apologise for my inappropriate outburst. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, so in that moment, she recognised that whilst she'd reacted that way, she didn't like the way that she reacted and she didn't like the, the impact that it had on the people around her or on herself. And so she took that moment to go, actually, I, I, I don't think that that was appropriate. And she came to that herself. So, you know, you get those little moments of wins every so often, but I think that's mm -hmm. vital throughout her whole adult life that we sit back and go, oh, that was a bit inappropriate. That, mm. that wasn't my best self in that particular moment. Is that who I am? Yeah. And perhaps more importantly, that isn't plugged into the values that I hold dearest. No, exactly. Yeah. So Rebecca, my final question is one that I ask every guest on the Eudemonia podcast. Can you recommend a morning reminder, so this might be a daily <laughs> ritual or a practice, an affirmation, that can help my listeners conduct themselves a little more authentically in their daily lives? I was reflecting on this, this question I thought you might ask based on your other podcasts and there's, there's one little thing that I do do every morning regardless of whether I'm, I'm sort of running late or not or, or under pressure that day and I always take just a good 10 or 15 minutes to literally stare out the window in the morning. Wow. Just sit and stare out the window and come to, come to a new place, you know, reflect, let things go from the day before because often they sit with you or you wake up with them and to sort of reset for the day ahead and find your new place to be you know, and, and pick your attitude for the day. That's absolutely beautiful. So it's like you find who you are and you plug into that before you start your day. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's a little bit like, you know, you might have eaten chocolate cake the day before, but this is a new day. What will I eat today? <laughs> you know, how, how will I address today? Because today is, is a fresh start. Rebecca, if people want to get a hold of you, I know that you have a personal Twitter account um, and then there's also New Zealand Story. So where can people find out more about you and New Zealand Story? Uh, well, if you follow me on Twitter, it's Bex355, that's my handle, you'll find that you get everything from me there. You get work, you get New Zealand Story, you get home life, uh, you get racing cars, you get children and parenting. By all means, follow me there. And through that, you'll find the um, more formal channels to follow. So just pop into my bio and you'll see the link to NZ Story there as well. Um, you can follow me on LinkedIn as well, but Twitter is probably the best place to follow me. Rebecca Smith, thank you so much for being here on the Udemonia podcast. It's a delight to have you here sharing such interesting insights into our personal brand, authenticity, and the way that we are perceived and would like to be perceived in the world. Thanks so much for being here with me. Well, thank you very much. I really do appreciate you taking the time to, to hear from me, and I hope that I'm able to provide just a few glimmers of interesting insight here and there for your listeners. As the American author Adam Grant once said, authenticity means erasing the gap between what you firmly believe inside and what you reveal to the outside world. 
You've been listening to the Eudaimonia podcast. If you'd like to learn more about how to live a truly flourishing life, please subscribe and check out eudaimoniapod.com for more inspiring episodes. I'm Kim Forrester. Until next time, be well, be kind to yourself, and be authentic.